So welcome to a discussion of chapter 41. We're going to talk about how heterotrophs obtain their macromolecules in this discussion. If you're a heterotroph like us humans, that means you need to eat others in order to obtain your basic components. So before we discuss how that happens broadly, I just want to make an argument for the common ancestry of all species. Uh, the very fact that I'm able as a human to eat so many different types of organisms and still use them to build up my body. I can eat things like plants, I can eat other animals, I can eat uh, even other protists like algae, I can even eat fungi. Um, I'm even able to eat very bizarre things um, that might have uh, originally come from other organisms. And I'm able to assemble all of those things, I'm able to cut them up into their constituent monomers um, and eventually take those to my cells and reassemble them into human versions of polymers of my own cells. So uh, I want to say that this is a really strong argument that we're all made of the basic same components. So how do heterotrophs do their job of, of obtaining their macromolecules? I'm just going to argue that all of them uh, are going to follow two basic steps. They have to digest the food first. They have to break it up into the constituent parts, monomers, eventually. Uh, and then they're going to absorb the parts they want into uh, uh, their body or their cells and eventually get it to the body cells that need those monomers. So let's discuss uh, some sample organisms. Fungi are not actually discussed in chapter 41. They're talked about in chapter 31, but there's no need to read that section for now. Uh, when most of us think of fungi, we think of the mushroom structure. That's actually its reproductive structure, though. So if I were to uh, show you this picture instead, um, these are kind of the, the more characteristic threads uh, that actually make up more of a fungus to begin with, a typical fungus. Um, and these little threads have a name. They're called hyphae. I don't I think I uh, emphasize uh, uh, this vocabulary term for this unit. Um, but these hyphae uh, extend throughout the food source where the fungus wants to grow, whether that be a soil fungus looking for nutrients in the soil, or perhaps um, that fungus growing on your food in the refrigerator um, that you left in there too long. Um, so they're growing with those little hyphae threads. And how a fungus actually digests is it releases digestive enzymes outside of its body cells um, into the environment in order to break down the food out there. And then they're going to absorb whatever nutrients they want into their body cells. So kind of a very different way of eating um, from what we animals are used to. If we were to think about other uh, heterotrophs, there are heterotrophic protists as well uh, who are going to take in food just directly into their cell, and they're going to have to have cellular organelles like lysosomes that we'll talk about later uh, with digestive enzymes to break up the, the, the things they take in and into constituent parts. There are actually some animals that, that keep this, and they basically just do all of their digestion in each one of their body cells. Um, so for example, the sponge is going to do uh, just sort of have all of its cells responsible individually for the job of digesting whatever they're able to find um, in the seawater floating around them. Um, but typically other animals are going to have specialized systems that do the digestive work for body cells. So let's talk about uh, some other types of animals and some broad digestive systems. Kind of an early uh, uh, primitive digestive system is the gastrovascular cavity. Um, so I'm asking you to imagine this sea anemone maybe has been sort of cut so that we can see some of its internal structures. Um, and the gastrovascular cavity is sort of this whole system right here. Uh, sea anemones will use their tentacles to draw food in. They will um, put them through the mouth. And then this is just sort of a specialized region where lots of digestive enzymes can be released to break up the food and um, eventually the nutrients can be absorbed and just sort of sent through simple diffusion to all the body cells around. Uh, but what's interesting about the gastrovascular cavity is that the mouth also has to then serve as the anus uh, or the wastes have to come back out through this same hole because there's, there's only one way in or out of this digestive system. So there's going to be uh, something in contrast to this system that we're just going to call the complete digestive tube that many other animal groups have. Um, and this allows for sort of ingestion through one, um, one area of the mouth and then releasing of wastes through a second hole, the anus. 
Um, and it, that just might seem obviously advantageous that we don't have to excrete our wastes through our mouth, uh, but it serves a second advantage as well. It's going to allow for some specialization um, inside that digestive system. Because if the food is always just traveling one way, then we might have more specialist organs that uh, uh, specialize in digestion early on, and then organs later on that specialize in absorption. And that's you know, exactly what we're going to see, and I'll kind of go through the details here in just a minute. So uh, again, broadly our goal is to digest first and then absorb. So let's talk about digestion first. There are really three different ways of, of digesting food to increase its surface area. Remember, that's the point of digestion. Um, we want to increase uh, uh, the, the uh, surface area of the food so that we can pull particular nutrients into the bloodstream. So there are three ways that our, our body does that. We're going to break up food mechanically. Um, our teeth and our mouth are going to help with that, and stomach churning is going to finish that job uh, and really pulverize it into a kind of liquid slurry. Uh, a, a second kind of digestion is through chemical hydrolysis. So uh, a lot of enzymes are released along the way that take polymers at the molecular level and cut them up into little monomers. Uh, and then finally, a lot of water is secreted along the way as well to help these nutrients dissolve. Remember that dissolving is basically just spreading out um, uh, uh, into the, the liquid solvent. So by dissolving things, we're helping spread them out too. I'll only, only mention bile for just a minute, uh, but bile is released by an organ that you don't need to know called the gallbladder. Uh, and bile just helps fats dissolve in that watery solution as well. Fats, if you recall, are nonpolar, so they don't dissolve particularly well. Um, but bile is kind of an interesting little half nonpolar, half polar molecule uh, that can attract fats but also attract water. Okay, so uh, just to trace that anatomy briefly, here's the mouth up here in which you're beginning mechanical digestion. You're releasing a lot of watery saliva with some enzymes in it that are starting to cut up polymers. Uh, when you swallow, your food travels down a tube called the esophagus that you don't really need to know, um, but it eventually travels to your stomach. Stomach is where me uh, the mechanical digestion is finished. You pulverize that food into the liquid slurry with the churning motion of the stomach. There's also some additional water released here, and acid as well. Uh, and that acid actually activates some more enzymes that continue to cut up polymers, hydrolyzing them. Um, and then finally, that liquidy uh, acidic slurry travels to the small intestine next. Um, it doesn't actually travel through this green tube just yet. That's coming afterwards. Uh, the small intestine is here in orange, and the um, enzymatic breakdown finishes in the small intestine. So there's actually a series of enzymes that are released by an, another organ called the pancreas that you do not need to worry about. And the pancreas organ is going to um, release all these digestive enzymes, and, and most of the chemical digestion is finished early on in the small intestine. So once we've really broken up the food and dissolved it well, it's very spread out. We're ready to think about absorbing those nutrients into the bloodstream. So how does that happen in the small intestine? So let's zoom into the small intestine and talk about uh, some structural features of it. Uh, right before I do that, though, let me just emphasize the overall length of the small intestine and how folded up it is. Um, it is so folded up so that it's allowing for maximum time for the food to travel through there and have nutrients be absorbed. Uh, the overall structure of the small intestine definitely matches its function. Um, and if we were to look at it more in depth, uh, if we were to imagine that this is kind of like a piece of small intestine up here, um, here's the inner intestinal space where that food liquid is, um, then there's actually a lot of like little finger-like projections kind of poking into that food um, slurry from all directions. They zoom into it a little bit more right here. This is what it might look like. Um, and then they've zoomed into one of them in particular so that we can really uh, see it a little better. Uh, we call this overall structure, this little hair-like projection sticking out of the small intestine. Uh, we would call one of them a villus, and we would call them plural, you know, considered together the villi. And uh, what is the purpose of them? They're almost like reaching into the food, but once again, increasing the surface area for absorption. 
Um, the, uh, uh, one villus is actually composed of maybe hundreds or thousands of cells. And so each one of these cells right here has potential access to the food that might be kind of uh, moving up and down, um, up the hill and down the valley. So there's plenty of chances for food to be absorbed into the capillaries or little blood vessels that actually go all the way up and down this villus as well on the inside. Uh, so the actual distance that a nutrient has to travel to go from um, the intestinal space into the bloodstream is actually a very small distance. Um, once again, the structure matches the function. As it turns out, the, the cells um, uh, that make up the villi actually produce little hairs themselves that stick out of the very tips of them. Um, we call those microvilli. So if my arm here is like a villus, then my fingers would be like little microvilli. Lots of hills and valleys for the food to travel and potentially be absorbed. Um, a very efficient organ. Okay, so what happens if some of those nutrients are indeed absorbed? Um, they actually will travel from the capillaries in the small intestines up to the liver. The liver is this big red organ up here. Uh, and why does the liver get the first crack at all of the nutrients? Because we, uh, the liver often serves as a kind of warehouse for nutrients, especially extra nutrients. Um, and then we can regulate the gradual release of nutrients into the broader bloodstream um, traveling through the whole body. Um, and the other reason is that liver cells contain lots of enzyme pathways for converting um, certain monomers into other monomers. Um, so um, to some extent, your body's going to be able to take whatever it is you eat and sort of make sure it has enough of whatever it might need by converting certain monomers into other monomers. Uh, there's a limit to how um, much maybe the liver can do that, though. That's why nutritional balance is going to be important in the long term. Uh, so if nutrients are sent to the liver, what happens to everything else that travels and finishes in the small intestine? The small intestine actually leads into the large intestine. Large intestine is also called the colon um, sometimes. Um, and that's this entire green tube. The primary job of the colon is to reabsorb all of that water that was invested earlier on. Um, the salivary glands releasing water, the uh, cells around the stomach releasing water, the cells around the small intestine releasing water. Um, that was all water that sort of came from the body. And so the, the goal is that the large intestine reabsorbs that water and brings it back into the body. Um, if you've ever had diarrhea before, that can be a case where your colon is irritated for whatever reason and you're not reabsorbing that water. Uh, and besides being kind of gross, um, it can also be extremely dangerous. Um, diarrhea is often the leading cause of death, especially in areas of the world where there's poor sanitation. Um, they simply just don't have enough access to uh, for water to rehydrate them themselves and so they tragically die. Uh, so the large intestine is extremely important in that regard. There is also some additional nutrient absorption that can take place here, although the bulk of it takes place in the small intestine. Um, and this is also where there's a lot of bacterial flora um, or bacterial species that live in uh, mutualism inside of us. They are going to be able to uh, further break down nutrients that maybe our own enzymes earlier on couldn't break down. So uh, uh, bacteria are going to release digestive enzymes outside their cells, and then they're going to certainly take some of the nutrients just for themselves. Uh, but studies have shown that these uh, mutualistic bacteria um, can actually increase our own caloric intake, uh, perhaps because they can help us absorb more nutrients than we would otherwise be able to break down and absorb. So they help us in many regards. They might even be a kind of defense against other bad bacteria that want to colonize that area. Um, they're going to defend their own turf pretty vigorously. So there's a lot of neat things they do for us, and of course we just feed them um, with whatever we happen to eat. So um, what happens to uh, materials if they travel all along this large intestine area and the uh, uh, material still is not absorbed? Well, it might sit here in an area just called the rectum. You don't need to know that term. Uh, but the rectum is just sort of the final area where uh, compact feces, if the water's been taken out of it, um, compacts um, and may be stored until you uh, feel the urge to defecate. And then you're going to eliminate those feces, obviously, just through the anus. 
Okay, um, so that's just kind of a broad survey of what happens in your own digestive system. I really don't want to focus on a lot of the detail that's presented in your book um, for our new curriculum. So um, as long as you can just kind of tell me the broad functions of some of these, uh, the structure and the function of the small intestine is something I'm, I'm partially interested in, uh, but that's really about it.